a word about policy integrity. Uh, for those of you who aren't closely familiar with our work, uh, policy integrity is a nonpartisan think tank based at NYU Law School. We are dedicated to improving the quality of government decision making, and our major area of focus is climate and energy policy. We have a staff of around 22, composed primarily of lawyers and PhD economists. Uh, we are particularly active in bringing the latest economic thinking into environmental policy and energy decision making through our research, publications, engagement in policy proceedings, and briefs in a wide range of court cases. And you can read about our work at policyintegrity.org. But the conference, we've brought together a stellar group of experts today uh, who also happen to be among the people I admire uh, and respect the most. Um, uh, and they will draw from their experience in the federal government, academia, and policy advocacy to explore key issues in climate economics. I'll briefly introduce our panelists. Um, and this just covers the tip of the iceberg. They have enormously impressive uh, track records. Maureen Cropper is a distinguished university professor at the University of Maryland, a senior fellow at Resources for the Future, and the former chair of the EPA Science Advisory Board uh, Environmental Economics Advisory Committee. Michael Greenstone is a Milton Friedman Distinguished Service Professor in Economics at the University of Chicago, where he also directs the Becker Friedman Institute and the Energy Policy Institute of Chicago. Michael co-led the interagency working group on the social cost of greenhouse gases during the Obama administration. Al McGartland is a director of the National Center for Environmental Economics and the chief economist at the US Environmental Protection Agency. I'm grateful to all of today's speakers for being part of this event. And I think you'll enjoy uh, hearing uh, from each of them. So I'll begin today's discussion by asking um, panelists various questions. So my opening question, I'll direct it, um, I I'll do this one alphabetically by first name. So I'll go to Al, <laughs> Marine, and Michael, um, is, what do you see as the largest opportunity and the largest barrier within climate economics over the next five to 10 years? And Al, you go first. All right, thanks, Ricky. Um, so I'm gonna go, I think a little bit off track here because you know we're of course gonna touch on the social cost of greenhouse gas work and other applications of climate economics in the, in the context of regulation. But I kind of wanna open this up a bit and talk about the other uh, tools and research that now is available and I think ready to be transferred to both policy and decision making. If you take, for example, climate risk modeling, um, we have both, I'm sure Michael's, hopefully Michael's going to talk about his work on damage functions and the spatial granularity that he's bringing to the table. I think that work is not only relevant in calculating the social cost of greenhouse gases, but it's tremendously relevant when we want to think about the benefits and costs of adaptation about permitting decisions, about infrastructure investments, et cetera. So I'm kind of excited about bringing kind of climate economics and climate analysis into other areas of climate decision-making beyond just mitigation and, and regulatory decision-making. I think similarly with the all government approach that the Biden administration is doing, we can talk about the Federal Reserve and Department of Treasury, the ESG investment sector, other financial regulators and how they might be interested in stress testing the banking system, stress testing the insurance industry, et cetera. I think the economy all needs to be kind of brought to, you know, be prepared for, for climate change in the future. So that's, I think, the, a big opportunity that's we're only beginning to get our hands around. Thank you. Um, Maureen, and yes, we will talk later. Um, my, my next question, the one after this is gonna be the social cost of greenhouse gases, so you can, deal with more general things or other things for now? Okay, well, you were asking about what were what were the largest barriers um, to climate economics and, barriers and, for, and oh. opportunities. Yeah. I mean, I'd say that the biggest challenge to climate economics is actually designing policies to reduce carbon emissions that are both politically acceptable and cost-effective. I mean, if you look at the effort that's gone into carbon pricing and um, structuring carbon prices either to follow the social cost of carbon or target consistent carbon prices. Um, it's been very difficult uh, to really implement strong price signals on the ground. 
So I think that making um, a price signal more, how shall I say it, palatable is something that is a big challenge. Um, in terms of opportunities, I think there are big opportunities for evaluating the policies that are actually in place, which are in most cases not direct pricing policies, to see how effective they are, um, how cost effective they are. There's you know, been a huge, a huge literature evaluating the Clean Air Act after the fact to look at um, its effectiveness and its cost effectiveness. And I think this needs to be done for climate policies and there are opportunities here. And I also think there are opportunities to understand the impacts of overlapping climate policies. I think this is an important um, research agenda that people are pursuing, but I think it's an opportunity. Thank you. Michael. Sure. Uh, so I agree as uh, usually the case with what Al and Maureen have both laid out. And I wanted to slightly build upon and make, make three points here. That's largely building on what they've said. Uh, the first is, I think it's like incredibly exciting that we're like at the dawn of what I think it was a new era where what we have known about climate damages has uh, largely kind of been almost, has been way too idiosyncratic. It's been built on uh, the pioneering work of Nordhaus, for which he rightly won the Nobel Prize, and a couple other people. Uh, but it hasn't had like a whole team effort on it in the sense that uh, those IAMs have not been super transparent. Uh, there have not been like replication studies and really what has been missing is like kind of data. Uh, and so we're at the dawn of a new era here where there is suddenly data and there is suddenly computing power that allows for kind of the professionalization of our understanding of uh, climate, uh, what the impacts of climate change will be. And so I think that's like an incredible opportunity. There's a lot of people working on it. I'm certainly spending a lot of time on it. Many other people are. Uh, and I, I think that's a, a great opportunity. Uh, related uh, in terms of the barriers, I think there's the old joke about economists only looking under the lampshade uh, or under the lamppost for their keys. And there are a whole series of parts of climate change that I think do not lend themselves to kind of the types of analysis that many economists are comfortable with. Uh, and I think we have to get better at that. Uh, ecosystem services valuation, it's, there's no quite, it's not zero, uh, and yet we don't know how to quantify it. And so then you kind of end up in this case where some people say it's infinite and some people say it's zero and you have no idea where it, the truth is. And so I, I think there's some early stage work going on there by some people, including I.L. Frank, who's uh, at the University of Chicago. But that's a very important area, but it's a big, that and other areas, there's really blind spots on uh, migration. You know, you look at the maps of what is expected to happen around the world, and you see these enormous damages where there's billions and billions of people. And then parts of the world where things will probably get better, let's call that Russia and Canada. Uh, and if there weren't borders, people would just move there. Uh, and uh, of course there are borders. And so trying to understand uh, what kind of pressures climate will put on migration and how societies will react to that, I think is a very, very important question. Uh, the last thing I would point to is there was a really important legislation uh, in the first in 1934 and then in 1964 uh, that required uh, public companies to report their profits uh, and their financials in a clear and consistent and truthful way. Uh, and there's been a lot of research on that, and that proved to be really important in giving people confidence in uh, financial markets and allowing for uh, financial markets to operate more efficiently. Uh, I, I see a lot of desire by public companies and in organizations who would like to begin to voluntarily do something about their carbon footprint. Uh, and the failure or the absence of kind of a credible numbers on what everyone's emissions are I think is uh, 
you know, it's just, it's a self-inflicted wound. Uh, and I think uh, and there is a great opportunity for the United States government to kind of set mandatory, uh, to set require reporting uh, on greenhouse gases and set standards for how that uh, is to be reported. And that it's good maybe in its own right, information is good. But in addition, I think it would help build the foundation of markets for people to voluntarily reduce their emissions, which are currently very, very immature and lead to uh, ineffective solutions often. So. Thank you. So let's move to uh, the social cost of greenhouse gases. Um, As many of you know, uh, the Biden administration reconstituted an interagency working group. The interagency working group came up with an interim number um, in, in, in February. It's been asked to determine in September um, if it's gonna meet this deadline, it has to do it this week or next week uh, on the scope of government decision-making for which this number would be relevant. And then um, by next January, it's supposed to come up with a final number um, of the social cost of greenhouse gases. Um, so I'm gonna direct this question to Maureen and Michael, to one or both of you. Uh, what do you expect to see from the interagency working group when it releases its new value in a few months? And what do you think would be the most significant effects of um, uh, changes that it will make? Well, I'll... I'll... Yeah, go ahead, Maureen. Start. Um, I mean, I, I think, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think the number is going to be a lot larger than $51. Um, I think there are a few reasons for this. I mean, if you look at the integrated assessment models that are underlying the current estimates, and you look at the climate science part of those models, you have the peak impact of emitting a ton of CO2 on mean global temperature temperature occurring in about 60 years from now. And recent climate science suggests this is going to occur in something like 20 years from now. So with any positive discount rate, putting improvements in climate science into these models is going to increase the social cost of carbon. Okay. Um, Al has already referred to the big improvements that have been made in measuring climate damages when you, again, look at what underlies the IMs that go into the $51 estimate, um, they essentially ignore the dozens of articles that appeared between 20, even 2010 and 2016, but also the work that's been going on at the Climate Impact Lab. I mean, if you look at the interim estimates there for the mortality component of the social cost of carbon, it comes out to be more than $22. That's just the mortality impact. Um, studies that have been done by Fran Moore suggest that the agricultural impacts uh, of CO2 are much larger than in the IMs that are going into the $51 estimate. Um, and finally, uh, uh, the $51 estimate is, is based on a 3% discount rate. That is the consumption rate of discount which is supposed to reflect the return on government bonds. And there has been pressure uh, to lower that rate from 3% to 2% going back to the Council of Economic Advisors before Trump um, was inaugurated. And so I, if you were to lower it from 3% to 2% and do nothing else, the social cost of carbon would go up from $50 to $125. Um, I'm not sure exactly what will happen with the modifications that are being made now, but I would imagine that this number is going to be considerably greater. Um, I think the larger number is going to put pressure on people in the private sector, in states, um, in terms of what they are doing, whether it would even prod the notion of having some kind of small carbon tax, I don't know, but I'm sure this number is going to be considerably low, absolutely. Thank you, Maureen. Michael? Yeah, I, Maureen has covered many things. I was going to say, let me and let me just try and summarize, or try and, uh, summarize in my own words. Uh, 
a ton has changed since 2009. Uh, and uh, we have a way better understanding of climate projection or improved understanding of climate projections. Uh, we have a way better understanding of economic damage. It's not that there's not room for improvement. There continues to be lots of room for improvement. Uh, there, in 2009 and 2010, uh, I think there was a judgment that it was too challenging uh, administratively to account for uh, uncertainty. And so uh, effectively the uncertainty was valued at zero. And yet we know people are willing to pay it, that people buy insurance to protect their house against fires, car insurance, all kinds of insurance. We know that people dislike uncertainty are willing to pay to get rid of it. And so I think that'll be an ad, that should be an adder that goes uh, on top of it. And uh, as Maureen said, I think the changes in international capital markets uh, that have no longer make it plausible to use a 3% discount rate uh, it, it is uh, going to be important. So like, you know, the end is like, just to summarize, like, hey, the world changed. It's a dozen years later. We know a lot more and some fundamentals have changed. And by chance, uh, I don't think this was predictable, but by chance, almost all of those things uh, point to, uh, as Maureen was indicating, uh, a, a larger number. So, you know, at the end of the day, that's going to be up to the interagency working group to figure out how to balance all that. That's their job. Uh, but, you know, the frontier of understanding has moved out. And if they want to keep the social cost or get the social cost of carbon back to the frontier of understanding, uh, following some of the things Maureen and I have uh, outlined, I think uh, would be a good way to move in that direction. Thank you. And Michael, I have a follow-up question for you. Um, you um, co-led the interagency working group um, in the Obama administration. Um, what were the most difficult ish decisions and challenges you faced then? And also, how do you think the current uh, interagency working group effort differs from the experience that you had in the Obama administration? Yeah, so I think... Uh... So first of all, it was maybe the most gratifying thing I've ever done professionally, uh, although it was maybe the hardest thing I've ever done professionally. Uh, and part of that was, uh, it's a, you just said, asked what was so difficult about it. Uh, there, and I hadn't appreciated this as an academic, but uh, the different agencies are there to fulfill the mission of their agency. They're not necessarily there to fulfill the broad societal goal. Uh, and so you had some agencies uh, that effectively thought that the social cost of carbon should be infinite. Uh, and you had some who effectively thought that it should be zero. And with good reason, it was kind of fitting with the mission of their agency. And so trying to get everyone on the same page of, uh, okay, let's find where there's overlap and what we can all uh, agree upon and what best reflects uh, scientific understanding. Uh, that was like a many step process. And uh, I think that was difficult and it wasn't because anyone was doing anything bad. They were just doing what they were supposed to do. Uh, and so finding common ground, that was a, a, a uh, big challenge. Um, one thing that we did that I tried to introduce with CAS, who I co-ran it with, was to try to make decisions about assumptions behind the veil of ignorance. Uh, and so that was, there's a lot of assumptions that go into the social cost of carbon calculation, the uh, assumptions about the equilibrium climate sensitivity parameter, the uh, population growth, uh, emissions growth, GDP growth, all kinds of things. And uh, we tried to do that without first looking at what the answer was going to be. You know, if we choose this assumption, it will change this, it'll change the social cost of carbon in this way. Uh, and, th you know, that was a very good tool. And I thought in making decision making, uh, you know, to best serve the broad interests of uh, the American public. Uh, but, you know, so some of the things you couldn't hide, like discount rate, everyone understood exactly what that was going to do to the uh, and so that was, uh, that, that, that was challenging. Um, you know, with respect uh, to the interagency working group, uh, the current interagency work, working group, uh, I've had a couple of inter, uh, brief opportunities to interact with them. 
Uh, and I, they seem terrific. Uh, it's a very, very hard job. Uh, and they're, you know, I, I'm not privy to what's really going on, but they, in the few exchanges on, you know, technical questions, they're asking all, all, all the right questions. And I, I know it's very complicated for Al to talk about this, and so I'm sure he won't, but uh, it was just such, Al was just so terrific in 2009 and 2010, uh, and in providing, leading his team to produce the analysis after we had made decisions, so behind the veil of ignorance. Uh, and it was really, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the same thing is going on this time, but. Great. I'm sure the ethics rule will permit us to heap praise on Al. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we're doing it. <laughs> oh, but wait, oh, wait. Actually, I do have one funny story, which I think I can tell. <laughs> uh, and I think Al probably remembers. Uh, there was a very, just to, you know, why was this hard or how was this hard? Uh, there was a very, very nasty fight about the uh, equal, equilibrium climate sensitivity parameter distribution. Uh, which basically says how much warming you'll get for a doubling of CO2, which is unknown. Uh, and so there's a distribution of it. And there, we had made a decision about that. And then a very important person in the government tried to relitigate that uh, after the number had come out and it had the flavor of mm, they didn't like the final number. And so they wanted to relitigate something that they thought would change the number. Uh, and it was very hard to reach resolution. Everyone was dug in. I, I don't know if Al remembers this. And finally, the only way we were able to resolve it, and remember, this was in the midst of the Great Recession, uh, was, and the economy was losing several hundred thousand jobs a month, was to say, okay, uh, would you like to ask the president if we should have an Oval Office meeting about the equilibrium climate <laughs> sensitivity parameter distribution? <laughs> and there was total silence, and uh, then we were able to move forward. So. That is a good story. That's very funny. Um, okay, on other efforts to calculate climate costs and impacts, um, let's move beyond the social cost of greenhouse gases. Uh, a recent paper from Joseph Stiglitz and Lord Nicholas Stern, as well as other papers um, on the marginal abatement cost methodology have argued alternative methods for calculating climate costs might be preferable to the social cost of greenhouse gases, at least in some cases. Um, what are your views uh, on these arguments? And I guess people have paid attention to these arguments uh, in part because of the sort of very distinguished trajectories of the two authors uh, that I mentioned. Um, is this an alternative? Does it do something else? Is it um, a diversion? How should we think about this question? Whoever wants to tackle this question first is more than welcome. I, I'm happy to say something about it. I mean, I must say, I, I turned off my video because I was informed in the chat that I was cutting in and out and I get these messages that my internet's unstable. So I hope you can hear me at least, okay? Yes, we can, Maureen. Okay, good. Okay, great. So I'll just keep it this way. Okay. Um, well, as you were saying, I mean, Joe Stiglitz, Nick Stern, the government of the UK, the government of France, um, all advocate pricing carbon by calculating the marginal cost of reducing CO2 along a quote unquote optimal emissions path. And this is, you know, sometimes people call this target consistent pricing. Um, I think it really raises three questions. Um, I mean, the first is obviously, how are you determining this emissions path? And do climate damages play a role in determining the optimal emissions path? I mean, originally, the social cost of carbon was dismissed, um, at least in the UK, because it was too uncertain. And the, the irony here is that you don't eliminate any of the uncertainty about climate impacts or about climate damages when some somebody, an expert, quote unquote, is determining the optimal emissions path and the optimal uh, climate target. Uh, I mean, the second question is, you know, Um, what policies are you going to use to achieve the desired emissions path? Because that's going to obviously drive the marginal cost of emissions that you choose. Um, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, and I don't think there's anything to matter if you can answer those two questions in a convincing way. Okay? Um, you can certainly calculate a target consisting, target consistent price. But what some people have gone as far as to say is that, well, 
well, we don't really need the social cost of carbon. Um, I think that's a real mistake. Even for people who want to use target consistent pricing, you need to make the impacts of climate change real to people. Um, when you look at a map of the US, what it will look like in 2100 under RCP 8.5, um, you are making the damages from climate change real to people. Um, you're also giving them some heads up on what the benefits would be from adaptation. So I think it's fine for people to take this approach, but it certainly doesn't um, obviate the need for calculating the social cost of carbon. Other perspectives? Uh, Suzanne, I'll shoot a couple of points. I think one is it's not clear how you would apply it. I'm sure we could come up with a way, but if uh, greenhouse gases are a co-benefit of a regulation, what kind of imputed value do you put on that? Presumably just the cost again, which I'm not sure that makes a lot of sense and when it, where it hangs together as well as it should. Um, and the second thing is a point, Ricky, that your that IPI has made and others, and I have made too, actually, in a, my recent brief editorial, but that, you know, to the extent that this economy, this, these governments are all, we're on a kind of yo-yo cycle of regulation so that, you know, uh, in the Trump administration, they would, might not favor climate change regulation or didn't favor climate change regulations, and now we do. I think by using a um, uh, social costs of greenhouse gases, we're injecting science into the, you know, the policy making record. And as you've made the point that records matter, right? And so uh, courts have determined that you have to address that record, et cetera, if you're gonna overturn a regulation, et cetera. So I think it could be a uh, much better stabilizing force for going forward with uh, a regulatory strategy across administrations. And then finally, uh, a lot of our laws do require that one looks at the benefits of a relation. For example, the vehicle fuel economy rules at DOT, the courts have ruled that they have to look at the damages from greenhouse gas emissions. And so it's not clear to me, although I'm not a lawyer, but how does that, does that count if you're using a implicit cost effectiveness number and not a social damages number in the, in the regulation itself? Right. Yeah, can I go a little bit further here? Uh, sure. Look, I think uh, obviously, uh, Nick Stern and Joe Stiglitz are brilliant, but I think there's a larger question here, which is, uh, is climate change like a moral issue uh, that is outside of the realm of economics? Uh, or is it a standard economics problem, which admittedly a very complicated one, but one that is subject to the usual forms of cost benefit analysis? Uh, and these guys are part of like kind of a movement to uh, say climate change is somehow special in some way. Uh, and climate change is special and it's a great challenge, but that it's immune to analysis uh, and it's immune to uh, cost benefit analysis. And instead uh, we should just, somebody should come up with a goal. And I think Maureen was dancing around this a little bit. Uh, who knows where that goal comes from? Uh, and then work backwards from that goal. So we should be net zero in 2028, or we should be net zero in 2029 or 2032 or whatever. I have no idea where that comes from. I like spending my life on economic damages. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that doesn't fall out of the analysis. That's coming from somewhere else. Uh, and I, you know, I am, I, I, I think that paper is actually in its own way kind of destructive. Uh, and uh, confusing to people and muddying of the waters. And I think if we could just focus on treating this as an economics problem, a really hard one, uh, but an economics problem that has costs and benefits, uh, and we can then work our way to kind of tangible uh, solutions. And, you know, I'll just as a final point, like I'm just going to add, like, there's a certain element of this setting targets, uh, which I find a, a, a complicated when you think of it. Part of the reason the climate problem is so interesting analytically, but so tough politically, is how you see 
uh, how everyone sees the climate problem depends critically on where they are in the world. Uh, and if you're in Bihar, India, where I do a lot of my research, and per capita electricity consumption is 250 kilowatt hours per person per year, it looks way different, <laughs> no, like way different, a million miles different than if you're in Cal, you know, in the Bay Area in California, where per capita electricity consumption is probably 13 or 15,000 kilowatt hours per year. And I, I, I just think setting these goals from nowhere uh, is, runs roughshod over the, that heterogeneity uh, and makes it harder. And it, even though the intent is good, makes it harder to kind of approach this problem in a lockstep way. So I, I'm actually, uh, I'd probably betray, not a very big fan of that approach. I think it's, uh, I, I understand what the authors are trying to do. Uh, and I, I share their goals that climate change is uh, maybe the one of, if not the most important challenge we face. But I don't think that that's the moment to suspend uh, analytical approaches to addressing it. Um, let me ask a follow-up question. I mean, I, I'm i going to step out of the moderator role and say that I agree with uh, what the panelists said, and particularly Al's point about what the courts demand. I mean, I think the courts really um, are now used to seeing estimates of costs and benefits to support regulations. They've said things like that. I mean, Justice Scalia in a um, significant opinion said a regulation does more harm than good is, um, is invalid. Um, and if um, the government now started using a different metric, um, it would put the whole regulatory process uh, in peril and would therefore be a really, really bad mistake. But the question I'm kind of grappling with is, as an alternative to the social cost of greenhouse gases, uh, the marginal abatement cost methodology seems like a non-starter, uh, despite the prominence of its proponents. But the question is whether they can play a useful role alongside. So for example, you know, let's say that someone thinks it is very important for the US to be on a trajectory to um, uh, keep um, increases of one and a half degree centigrade, the world has to, you know, be there and the US has to do its share, whatever its share might mean. But that somehow or other, we need to be on this trajectory or else bad things will happen. Um, and, and from that trajectory and goal, they derive uh, their marginal abatement cost number. Now we could compare that to the social cost of carbon. If the social cost of carbon um, is um, lower, um, we would learn that even if, um, the sort of, even if those costs were shown to every sector of the economy, we would not be in a, on a trajectory to meet this um, one and a half degree number. If the social cost of carbon were the same, we would say, well, if only all of the economy was shown this number and used it in its decision making, then that's exactly what we would get. If it was higher, you would say, well, this might work out. We might not need to impose it on the whole economy. Uh, I mean, realistically, there'll be parts of the economy that will be not, um, that it won't reach because they'll be exempted from a uh, regulation or a carbon tax or cap and trade scheme or whatever. But we're still okay because we have a higher source cost of carbon than marginal vacant cost. So the question is, is there useful information to be, um, to be de derived from the two metrics and is understanding the relationship between the two of them a useful exercise? So I'll pose this to with Al, Maureen, or Michael, whoever wants to tackle it. I think it's fine to calculate the two of them. I mean, I, I'm not ob objecting and, and the kinds of comparisons you're making, I think, are useful. Um, at the same time, I mean, the point that Al was making is if you really, I mean, it's given that the target consistent price is not a measure of the marginal benefits of reducing CO2. I mean, it, you can't use it in regulatory impact analyses. There's certain types of um, decisions you just can't apply it to um, in terms of, is it a bad thing to calculate um, and to make the sorts of comparisons you were talking about, um, I wouldn't object to that personally. Okay, um, let's move to um, a different challenge in figuring out climate costs and impacts. Um, and my question, my next question is, 
What do you think can be done to improve granular and sectoral understanding of climate impacts? And what do you view as the most promising research in this area? I mean, I think this is a question for, for Michael. I mean, clearly, <laughs> although um, uh, it may be tooting his own horn, so to speak, but, but I mean, the work that's been done by the Climate Impact Lab, certainly at, at very fine spatial resolution, something like 25,000 um, geographic entities in the world, and for eight different sectors, I think is, is something that's, that's really important. And as I said earlier, it's important both in terms of um, making clear the implications at, at a level people can understand, um, the level of their community for what the damages are, and also it can promote adaptation. Um, I think, you know, I'm not the person to describe the research that's going on at the Climate Impact Lab, but I must say it does seem to me that this is the path that, that one wants to follow. So Michael, maybe you can give us a brief um, like executive summary of what the work consists of, and but then tell us a little more about how you see it affecting public policy. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. And thank you for the kind words, Maureen. Uh, I think it is just a step back what was the case with the IAMs is they had a terrible time telling you what the impact of climate change were going to be where you live. Uh, they were, you know, the best, I think the most disaggregated was to divide the world into 16 regions. Well, you know, that has the unfortunate flavor of saying that climate change is going to be the same in Miami as it is in Minneapolis, which, uh, you know, on its face will be very, very different. Uh, and that and that I think led to, uh, you know, statements like global GDP will decline by four percent by the end of the century, on average. And the problem is nobody lives at the global average or global mean, uh, and they, you know, they live where they live. And so what we tried to set out to do with the Climate Impact Lab, which was not possible when Bill Nordhaus uh, and Richard Toll and Page. Uh, set out their IMs because the computing power wasn't there, uh, was to really produce much more granular estimates and build it up kind of in a bottoms up way. Uh, and, you know, what emerges uh, are these, you know, very, very different findings. Uh, like, you know, just to, you know, within the United States, uh, when really hot days come, they don't kill anybody in Houston. Uh, the reason they don't kill anybody in Houston is because Houston is engaged in all kinds of adaptive. Anyone who's been to Texas in the summer knows uh, the central role of air conditioning and the different adaptations people take. In contrast, when hot days arrive in you know Seattle or Portland, they're like lethal, uh, and that's because those places have not uh, adapted to it. So I, that's just a small taste of what has emerged from an approach that aims to recognize and capture and reflect back at the world. Uh, the heterogeneity uh, in damages. Uh, and, you know, that's just with the United States. Of course, you could do it globally and see that things are very different in uh, hot parts of India than in, uh, you know, uh, Siberia. So really uh, what we have tried to do is take advantage of the advances in computing and access to data. And that has just uncovered, you know, new finding after new finding, just an endless playing field of that. Uh, and there are two, I think, purposes, or maybe three purposes of that. The first is we can develop an empirically founded social cost of carbon and we don't have to guess anymore. Uh, the second thing is by giving that granular information, uh, I think, and this has been touched upon already, it does two things. It allows communities to know what they should do to adapt. What you should do in Miami is very different than uh, probably what you should do uh, in uh, Seattle. Washington. And then the kind of X factor, which I can't prove, but I think is true, is by communicating to people what climate change will be and means where they live. Uh, my view is that that might unlock some of the political resistance that is existing about doing something about climate change. Uh, because instead of saying, well, the global mean, something's going to happen the global mean, you can now say something, this is going to happen where you live. So. 
Thank you. Um, moving to Maureen's research. Maureen, you've done um, significant research on climate impacts in India, including on the mortality impact of plant coal plants and the health benefits in India of greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, can you talk a little about the connection between this type of economic research and the policy decision-making processes in India? Well, yes, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I mean, let me first say that, you know, if you look at what the World Bank and the IMF have been pushing, so to speak, to make carbon taxes palatable, it's to calculate the health co-benefits of reducing fossil fuel use. Um, and this is something, you know, a message which they've been trying to get across. And certainly if you burn less coal, especially in coal-fired power plants, that don't have a lot of pollution control equipment on them. Um, unless coal is going to really lower PM 2.5 levels. Um, I mean, for this to have an impact on policy, it has to be the case that the country really cares about the health impacts of PM 2.5, of, of local air pollution. Um, I've done work with collaborators in India, and members of the Global Burden of Disease team to try to get the message across and I must say, so is Michael. I mean, he's developed an air quality of life index that was the impact in India of air pollution control policies on people's life, life expectancy. Um, I'm not sure, well, Michael can also comment, I'm not sure that these health impacts are necessarily, how should we say it, a priority um, <laughs> in India right now. Um, what we did in, in this research was actually with an air quality modeler in India and other local collaborators to the number of deaths that were being caused by the 2018 stock of power plants, something like 80,000 a year. What would be, what would happen if all the plants that were on the books in November 2019 also started operating and that would increase deaths by another 20,000. And we calculated, you know, if, if you wanted to impose a tax equal to the, those health damages, it would raise the price of electricity by something like 20%. It would also happen to equal the amount of a $10 per ton carbon tax. Um, you know, we published these results. Um, I actually wrote to my co-authors in India last night to get their opinion of whether this had any impact on anything. Um, and I must say, if you look at the 2021 national electricity policy in India, it continues to place reliance on coal, although it does re recommend reducing the emissions, the local air pollution emissions from coal-fired power plants, which of course will help people in India, but um, will not um, help the global environment. So I think, you know, doing this research is important. Whether the message gets through and, and is listened to, I think, is another issue. And actually, I would, really, I would like to hear from Michael because he's done so much work in terms of pollution control policy in India, and I think probably has a, has a closer association with policymakers than I do. Michael? Yeah, so uh, I think Maureen's work I just uh, has really been super instrumental in advancing understanding in India. And, uh, you know, I, I, look, we're academics, we're not policymakers. And uh, they, we have very different jobs uh, than policymakers. And what I see as being so important about Maureen's work and other work that tries to illustrate and make concrete what the costs are of, uh, in this case, uh, air pollution, are uh, if we're not putting that information out there in a kind of fine pointed way, so it can't, it's not just buried in the journal of academic blah, 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 uh, it can kind of, it, 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 it becomes like a rock in the shoe of policymaking uh, and that just can't, eventually can't be ignored. And so if someone's gonna read one of Maureen's papers or one of my papers, and the next day go, you know what? I think we should enact a new law and outlaw air pollution or something like that. That's not happening. Uh, but, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago that the Minister of Environment and Forest in India uh, was saying that the Indian body had evolved in such a way that it was immune from particulates air pollution. Like that was within the last decade. Uh, and 
you know, by pushing out of these facts and empirical findings, uh, I think you can slowly uh, build the case and maybe sometimes frustratingly slow uh, that this is an important area uh, of concern. Uh, and maybe most importantly, you know, turning back to Al's, uh, you know, right down the middle of the plate for Al's thinking about costs and benefits and policy is like uh, that policies that reduce air pollution are not just on the cost side of the ledger, you know, costs on industry, they actually have tangible benefits. Uh, and uh, I think that it is, that is something that we can do as academics is try to communicate what the costs and the benefits are and then let that feed through the policymaking process. But without making it clear that there are benefits, say, from reducing air pollution, uh, then it's a no-brainer not to have air pollution policy because it only has costs. And so I, that, that's why I think these kind of efforts are very important. Thank you. Um, as we shift to another topic, I want to remind attendees uh, to put questions in the Q&A. There are already some. Uh, right around 340, I'll turn to questions from the audience. It would be nice to build a robust uh, set of questions. So I want to turn our conversation to distributional analysis and environmental justice. Uh, the Biden administration, uh, as well as many state level policymakers around the country, are increasingly seeking to make environmental justice a stronger focus in climate policies. My question is, uh, what can economists do to improve our understanding of environmental injustice and distribution and equity? Uh, and what can be done better in terms of policy analysis and design? Um, maybe we'll start with Al. I know the federal government is focused on these issues right now. Thanks, sure. I'd love to talk about this. Uh, in fact, it is definitely a priority for uh, the National Center for Environmental Economics as well. Um, I think, as Michael alluded to, we now have data. That's nowhere is that more true than in the United States in terms of environmental, you know, contaminants and insults to whether it be air toxics or you know, criteria air pollution or water pollution, etc. So I think I think now with the spatial granularity that we have and the modeling tools that we have, it is possible to really do a great deal to move the ball forward on environmental justice, particularly in the context of regulations. If you look at the AIM Act uh, rule, which is designed to phase out hydrofluorocarbons, and of course, uh, you know, EPA likes market incentives as a general matter because of the flexibility and the cost minimization properties, but there is a chance that these, basically EPA was phasing out the production of HFCs, powerful global warming chemicals, and as we phase them out, the suppliers had the ability, the trade permits to produce this stuff. But with that flexibility comes a real risk, right? That the, the emerging pattern of production might be in uh, you know, areas of the country that where there's already disproportionately high exposure to air toxics and there would be air toxics associated with the production of these chemicals like there are for most chemicals. And so, this data allows us to identify these risks beforehand instead of waiting to, on the back end. So that was discussed in the rule, the analysis was presented, and I think it moved the ball uh, a lot forward. That said, there are big challenges ahead though, because right now we have no way of, uh, we can put out indexes, and of course all economists know that indexes can be uh, troubling sometimes because they're not always consistent, but. We need, really need a way to think about the cumulative burden of these uh, disproportionate exposures in a sort of scientifically viable way that's consistent across across rules and across places. So. Thank you. Um, Maureen, Michael, any further thoughts on distribution? Well, I'm not, I mean, one thing I can say is that certainly, I mean, as Al was saying, you, you need to understand how pollution varies by by income, by race, ethnicity. I mean, the availability of, in the case of air pollution, the availability of satellite data combined with you know, data from air quality modeling at very fine spatial scale has enabled researchers to really answer these questions of what is the distribution of air pollution by income, by, well, you know, by census, block group and by and then by income race and so forth. So you have you know, studies like the Curry Voorhees Walker study that's looking at how exposure to PM 2.5 has changed, you know, between 2000 
in 2015 by um, by racial group. Um, information like that is, you know, it's, it's very important. I mean, you want to know, first of all, if progress has been made, but you also need to know what things look like now if you're going to design policies. So I think that's the case. And I mean, also, to be honest with you, if you're going to look ex ante at the impacts of a policy, you're going to have to look at literally sort of which way the wind blows. I mean, in the case of air pollution, but these, you know, these impacts can be modeled and they are modeled. And I think that that helps um, in constructing policies that should improve environmental justice, frankly. Can I just weigh in here too? I think uh, what has happened is this explosion of computing power and explosion of data has opened our eyes to a whole variety of things. I was talking about some of them with climate damages. It's absolutely true uh, with respect to air pollution exposure and other environmental contaminants as well. And I, 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 there's great opportunity and we've already been making some important progress that Al and uh, Maureen both pointed to. I just wanna raise another question though that is related to this. Uh, once you get all that right, then I think there's a second question, well, how should we value those risks? Uh, and currently we use a kind of what is called a homogeneous VSL or a single number number for the value of statistical life, which is used to at least value the mortality consequences. Um, I think actually that's a, it's, the data don't support or increasingly are revealing that data don't support that everyone has the same value of statistical life. Uh, and not just that, even within a person that the value of statistical life could vary depending on the risk they face. Uh, and where I want to connect these two is if you have particular groups, let's call them, you know, particular racial groups or particular income groups, who are facing very high risks uh, due to living in uh, places with high levels of pollution, it could well be the case that the kind of average value of statistical life is too low. Uh, and because they're facing such high risks, you may be at the part of in the wonky talk of economists, their bid curve or their indifference curve, where their willingness to pay for improvements uh, in environmental quality are very high. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm speculating as to whether or not that's the case. But I guess what I'm just trying to raise up is that I think it might be important to begin to think about how valuations uh, vary with exposure to risk as well. Thank you. Um, well, we're on the subject of distribution and uh, environmental justice. Uh, one lightning rod in the discussion of environmental justice, um, fairly or unfairly, has been market-based mechanisms like cap-and-trade programs or carbon taxes. Uh, these tools are generally loved by economists, but they have a complicated history uh, with environmental justice communities in places like California. Um, do you think that market mechanisms can be designed to successfully take uh, environmental justice concerns into account? And do you see a future for such policies um, taking those concerns into account? Well, I mean, if it's okay for me to jump in, I mean, the, the, yeah, the tradition, I mean, the traditional argument is, look, if you've got a cap and trade system and if the buyers of permits are located in an area that's uh, that contains low income or underrepresented minority populations and, and the sellers of the permits are in um, you know, a higher income, um, say predominantly white area, then what's gonna happen when you have the cap and trade system is you're gonna have emissions moving into uh, for minority areas. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the concern. Um, I mean, this all depends, of course, on what marginal abatement costs are in different locations. And it also depends, in the case of air pollution, on which way the wind blows. And so, you know, there have been studies, recent studies, both of the, in, the environmental justice impacts of the reclaim program in Los Angeles, uh, an article by Aaron Manser, and Glenn Sheriff, which look at how exposures to 
non-Hispanic whites, Hispanics, Blacks were changed, this is all exposure to Knox, um, by the Reclaim program. And looking at cumulative distributions of exposure for each of these three groups, um, you want the percentage of people exposed to different levels of pollution, you want that curve to be falling as a result of a, a policy. And so they actually do this for you know, each of those three groups compared to the situation before Reclaim and also compared to a counterfactual command and control approach to reducing NOx. And they find that for all three groups, there has been a reduction in exposure as a result of the Reclaim program. Um, in fact, the exposure ex post for Blacks is actually lower than, lower than the curve for either Hispanics or non Hispanics. Hispanic whites. So here's a situation where, you know, it's maybe ex ante, you would have thought that this would have been something that would disadvantage certain groups, but ex post, there's no evidence of this. Um, there's also the paper uh, by Hernandez, Cortez, and Mang that's looking at the impact of the uh, cap and trade program for or the carbon market program in California, which also found actually beneficial effects reducing the exposure gap um, as a result of this program uh, rather than, than widening it. I mean, so I think it's one of these things where you really do need to look into the details of this in terms of whether um, a cap and trade program is going to actually lead to worse outcomes. It's complicated. Doing it ex ante is hard because you do have to know who are going to be the buyers and sellers of permits, and you also have to be able to work out the atmospheric chemistry, which is non non-trivial. Okay, can I? Uh, Maureen has given an excellent uh, summary of two very important papers and highlights some really important issues. I I want to just make a related point here, which is I find uh, this confusing uh, the pushback against market-based mechanisms. Uh, one, they make getting rid of pollution cheaper. Uh, and we tend to buy more of stuff when it's less expensive. Uh, and that is not to brush aside distributional issues. Distributional issues are super important. Uh, but that's like a design feature of a cap and trade program. Uh, if you want to take account of the distributional issues, uh, you could have location differentiated permits. Uh, it's it's not, not rocket science. Uh, it's just a super easy design feature, not harder than setting the cap. Uh, in fact, I'm working with the state of Gujarat in India to have location differentiated permits for a particular trading program there. So like this is not rocket science uh, and using it and have, but, but, and that is part of where, you know, wh why I'm, uh, you know, a little troubled by the pushback on market-based mechanism for this reason, because it's, and instead of working towards a solution, it's kind of put a cloud of confusion over this uh, that I think has made it harder uh, to advance environmental goals. Uh, and so rather than say, hey, how can we take these very important uh, distributional goals on board and build them into the design of the program to ensure that we're meeting them, uh, it kind of becomes a block on making advances in, in environmental quality. It, it's a kind of a perverse outcome, but that's 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 what it looks like to me. Thank you. Al, do you uh, want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I do. A couple of little points. Uh, one, I think it speaks to, you know, EJ has two components. One is this disparity and, you know, environmental contaminant exposure, et cetera. But the other is sort of a meaningful role in the process. And it seems to me that when... Uh, you know, I, was a, I didn't follow it closely, but when California started its you know, cap and trade system, you know, I, I, I expect that they had to do it over again. They would have much more afforded a, a much more meaningful role for the environmental justice communities in the state of California. Second point is that the last auction, California grandfathers in a lot of the permits, but they auction off a great deal too. They netted over a billion dollars in the last auction. 35%, I think it's 35% goes to environmental justice communities now. So in practice, I think it's actually a little bit more than that as it turns out. But so my point is only being one of the 
advantages of cap and trade systems or carbon tax systems that it does give you a revenue stream uh, along with Michael's differentiated uh, permit systems to think about how one might uh, arrange ways to offset both the regressivity of climate regulations, but also the uh, maybe also embed in it, uh, you know, design features that deal with uh, localized pollutants as well. And I, you know, I want to underscore something else out there. Uh, I, I don't live in California. Uh, and so I, I don't have like super visibility into it, but I, I have heard the same thing that uh, uh, there, it is important to execute on environmental goals not in a purely technocratic, uh, hey, the Blackboard version of cap and trade says it'll all be fine way, but taking on, you know, we live in a democracy uh, and allowing people to express their views and have input into the design of the system is very important for the credibility of the system in the long run. Uh, and uh, I think that is important for all policy, not just cap and trade policies. Thank you. Um, maybe a very quick round on uh, current climate related legislation and the role of economic analysis. Uh, as Congress considers both a major infrastructure bill and a budget reconciliation bill, uh, both of which contain very significant climate related components, uh, we're starting to see estimates of jobs created or lost, uh, lost and other impacts on the economy. Uh, what types of economic analysis do you think are meaningful and useful in, on these issues? And uh, what is just noise? How should we think about the job impacts of these big legislative initiatives? I mean, it's, it's certainly important to calculate these. I mean, if you, if you look at, again, if you look at studies that have worked done of the Clean Air Act, the impact of the Clean Air Act on employment. I mean, Michael did a very important study of this, looking at declines in employment in non-attainment versus attainment counties. Um, Reed Walker looked at impacts on earnings of workers as a result of legislation or regulations under the Clean Air Act. Um, there's been you know, a lot of work also on, on the location of, of industry. I mean, I think that these impacts are important to document. They may be difficult ex ante. I mean, you're referring to studies like the analysis group, analysis of the CEPP and so forth. But I, th I think that these impacts are important to document. They're certainly important politically, um, but I think it's also important to understand the implications, even if they may not enter in a strict benefit cost sense, um, of, of these regulations. Um, I, 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 let me just add on here. I think uh, it's important to do a full accounting of the costs and benefits of uh, all of these policies. Uh, there are, I think we have learned, probably economists were too, a little blind to this, uh, that uh, even in uh, that job losses have costs. Uh, there, people don't just immediately find a new job. They don't instantly move from a town in South Carolina to Phoenix to get a new job uh, because their factory closed. And so I think bringing in what, you know, it's an awful way economists talk about things like transition costs or fr frictions and things like that. Those are real costs for real people. Uh, and I think that should be part of uh, any analysis of the costs and benefits uh, of a policy. I, I think, uh, but it's just a part. Uh, and uh, I think the environmental benefits uh, have to be brought to the forefront. That has not always been the case when talking about some of these policies. Like, I think it's only maybe in the last week or so that I think I've really seen real coverage of the various features of uh, uh, the reconciliation bill on, you know, how many tons of CO2 each feature is going to be worth uh, in, uh, in, in terms of reducing CO2. Uh, and uh, I, I think also being, you know, on the level about what the cost industry and workers are going to be is uh, very important. But 
Um, so jobs are part of that, and there's no doubt. And then particularly when there's a concentrated losses in small communities, we know that can be quite devastating. Uh, and so that should be part of the analysis. Uh, but uh, I think leading with jobs uh, can often be a mistake uh, or uh, in, in that the benefits of environmental regulations are usually environmental. Al, uh, EPA has done significant work in this area. What yeah, factors do you want to share? Well, I got my comeuppance a bit. I, like a lot of economists, like Michael alluded to in the early days, we talked about net jobs as our single summary statistic of a, of a major policy. And that does, that just masks too much of the realities and the, and the true cost of you know, job losses and job gains. In fact, in many cases, an involuntary job separation is very different than hiring a new person who's never worked before, right? So uh, all those things matter. And I think it took uh, economists and, uh, you know, too, too long perhaps to, to learn that job. But I think we're doing a much better job at that now. And I think on these policies as well, that's, I think, the orientation that we're going into this. So, um, although it's hard, it's a lot easier when we're talking about a single regulation on a cement industry or a steel industry than it is the kinds of sweeping policies that we're talking about here that affect almost every sector of the economy. But that's, that's, a, that's just a, a, a modeling matter, not a conceptual problem. Thank you. Well, it's 3.40 and as promised, I'm gonna to turn to questions from the audience. There's a lot more that the panel could have talked about, but we are gonna uh, move to this new phase in, in, our, in our webinar. And I'll start with, a and there are many good questions. I might not be able to get to all of them, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. It's not necessary for every panelist to answer every question. So just um, address whichever ones you'd like. Uh, the first question I'll ask is from Kathy Kling. Uh, Kathy asks, uh, would each panelist share what he or she believes are the most important missing components of the social cost of carbon? Um, for example, ecosystem migra services, migration, et cetera. Uh, can I just repeat Cassie's question back to her and say, uh, <laughs> yes, I think ecosystem service valuations and migration probably are at the top of my list of things I wish we understood better. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't, th those are probably near the very, uh, very top. I think as a generic issue uh, across sectors, it would be worse making progress, uh, but struggling to uh, come up with reliable estimates of the costs and benefits of adaptation, which have to be part of uh, uh, the SEC. Well, there's also, of course, the issue of tipping points, which yeah. uh, you know, in a recent paper, Bruno Wagner and, and Simon Dietz and co-authors were trying to address because this is obviously something on, that, that is a concern to people. I mean, they, they've made some inroads here looking at particular types of tipping points and trying to monetize their effects. It's, it's a tough call, but I think that that's also something that people feel really has been neglected. Thank you. Um, a question from Joshua Sarnoff says, a recent report criticizes carbon border adjustment mechanisms, and he gives us a link to that report. Um, any thoughts on how the social cost of carbon and its influence on policy measures relates to willingness or not to impose uh, carbon border adjustments? Any views on carbon border adjustments? I mean, if we had a social cost of carbon applying economy wide, I think it would be easier to have uh, carbon border adjustments. Uh, but, you know, Ricky, I'd be curious what you think. You know, this feels a little bit like a legal question. Um, yeah, I, I, Michael, I, I, I agree with you. I think if we had adopted it economy wide, there would be all kinds of mischief that would come if we didn't. Um, uh, use them. I'm not um, an international trade economist. I have colleagues who do that stuff and like every field there are complications around how and when they can be imposed and whether they would pass scrutiny. But I think it's something, it's a policy tool that should definitely be on the table. Oh, I, I definitely think it should be on the table. Uh, just the implementation, both practical challenges. I remember sitting in meetings 
about how you would calculate uh, what the implied tax was on a bar of steel uh, or the carbon content of bar of steel. And then, of course, the, there's a whole, as you say, a whole series of legal issues that uh, are above my head. There's also the issue of if we regulate an industry for its criteria air pollutants, say, and that drives the industry to a whole new technology that's much less carbon intensive, do you reward that in a quarter carbon adjustment or not? I'm actually not sure there's a right answer, but that's a big deal, I think, in, for this kind. Yeah, it is a big question. Um, question from Clay Benitez. Can we have the panel weigh in on the Baker Schultz plan? Or if you already published the position, provide a link to that. So the Baker Schultz plan, if I recall, is something like $50 a ton tax with maybe 100% rebate uh, uh, with a redistributional bet set. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a great idea. Uh, I, uh, it's certainly better than any carbon policy we have. I, I mean, I agree. I know very little about the plan. Um, I was actually just brushing up the other day on you know, Canada's carbon tax policies and their also their returns of, of revenues. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's something <laughs> we should strive for. So to the extent the Baker Schultz plan moves us in that direction, I think that would be great. It, you know, and let me just say, you know, what is so appealing about it? Uh, it is, would treat carbon equally no matter where it appears. Uh, and that has a lot of benefits in terms of efficiency uh, and reducing the overall cost of policy. Uh, and an important criticism of carbon pricing has been uh, that it's going to disproportionately uh, fall on the poor. Uh, and the Baker Schultz plan, as I understand it and remember it, uh, recognizes that that is there's nothing about carbon policy that requires that to be the case. It's just a design feature, uh, and uh, you can change the design feature to totally take that uh, consideration or concern off the table. You could make it so that you know at least pretty far up the income distribution, uh, lower income people are better off uh, with carbon pricing than without it. And uh, so, in that respect, I think it's a uh, you know to uh, as I said, better than any carbon policy that I'm aware of that we currently have in the United States of America. Thank you. Um, a question from Brian McGalley. Um, do you see any practical application of the social cost of carbon in the context of FERC, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission decisions involving the electricity sector? Uh, I, and if Al Marine probably know more about this, I'm going to say something very generic. Or I would say something generic. So I'd probably prefer to hear them if they have something specific to say. Um, I, I think you'll say something at least as intelligent as I would, Michael. So I don't really know that EPA has a letter on the record on this issue that we uh, sent a couple months ago, I think. So in the affirmative that it, there's a role for it to play in this. I, I, um, let me, so the generic thing I'll say is the a great power of the social cost of greenhouse gases or carbon uh, is it provides a way to level, uh, to create a level playing field for decisions. Uh, and so I ex suspect, I don't know the specifics of what uh, Brian's question uh, where it's coming from, but I suspect where he's coming from uh, is that in building out uh, wires or transmission, uh, we're only thinking about the economic benefits in terms of uh, electricity rates uh, and not accounting uh, for the benefits that could be provided by bringing low, uh, low carbon energy sources to more parts of the country. And were the social cost of carbon to be used in that decision-making process, uh, I expect there would be greater construction of uh, transmission lines than we currently see. They would facilitate, you know, taking wind in the, that wind region in the U.S. or the sun region in the U.S. 
and using it to spread power uh, across the country. I mean, in connection with that question, I mean, I think a very promising policy would be for FERC to provide um, for um, a carbon adder in decisions about uh, the deployment of energy in the wholesale markets. Um, and, um, and my colleagues at Policy and who have looked into this are quite certain that FERC has the authority to do that, at least if it's acting on an application by a, uh, an RTO or ISO. Um, the New York R RTO, the New York ISO has, is on record as supporting it. And I could imagine that um, if the stars are aligned and there are, there are some requests, formal requests made to FERC, which haven't happened yet, that FERC could do that. And that would be essentially the equivalent of a carbon tax on the wholesale electricity market, which would not be at the level of the social cost of carbon, which would be a very attractive policy. You know, then what FERC does with transmission, which is a issue that Michael was just focusing on, and also with um, the permitting of pipelines, where a significant consequence are the upstream and downstream uh, greenhouse gas emissions is, is important also. And on that, on the pipeline question, there are all kinds of skirmishes going on in the courts now where FERC has been, has kind of so far dragged its feet, but it's getting a fifth uh, commissioner, is gonna have a three commissioner democratic majority. We might see FERC playing uh, a very different role. Which leads me to another question. I mean, this administration has talked about an all of government approach to climate change and agencies that had not seen themselves as being in the, Kind of climate change business will be in the climate change business. Um, this question is um, a generalization of, of some other questions that are in the queue, including one by Grant Ferrier. Uh, can you say something about the possible policies on carbon disclosure that might be adopted by the SEC or perhaps by other financial regulatory agencies or other agencies? Um, any thoughts on design questions, their promise, their priority as instruments in the fight to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or any other thoughts uh, on these policies that you might have? You know, I touched upon this in the beginning. Uh, it is a self-inflicted wound that we don't have uh, credible mandatory disclosure uh, of carbon emissions. Uh, and uh, it is preventing the creation of what I suspect would be a very large market for voluntary reductions. Uh, but it is also in affecting, uh, you, you know, if we had this information, uh, financial markets would better be able to digest the risks that different businesses face and different pieces of land face. And, uh, you know, it's a little hard to predict all the directions it would go, but like, we should get that information in a credible way and we should put it in the wild uh, and let markets sort out how to use it. And I suspect there's going to be lots of creative ways to do it. But it's, it's an embarrassment that we don't have that right now. Uh, on note, I think only New Zealand has a public, publicly traded firms law that requires them to disclose their greenhouse gas emissions. But the SEC, as you mentioned, Ricky, is working on it. In fact, there's a uh, someone from the SEC is on detail to my office when we're trying to coordinate. It turns out that the Air Office uh, has a great deal of expertise in this area. There's something called the Greenhouse Gas Reporting Rule, where EPA does require the largest sources to report their greenhouse gas emissions. And what's really special about that is that uh, EPA had the foresight to be able to aggregate up to the corporate level from those survey respondents, which is, I think, it might be unique in EPA data that instead of a, just the facility level data, we have the corporate level data as well. And so I think that's going to be important, that expertise and transferring that to the SEC, but also thinking about, you know, the so-called scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions and how broad uh, does the SEC go? I don't have any insight into where they're going with that. But that's, I think, a major, uh, you know, policy decision to be made down the road. And on that, that, there's a follow-up question from my NYU colleague, Dick Berner. Can the panel comment on the SEC's climate disclosure, disclosure request for information and related disclosure proposals? Anything missing? Anything not needed? Does someone want to um, step into that level of detail? I'm not the right person. Okay. Neither am I. I my sense is they're looking at everything. 
that's can, I, can I ask you one follow-up question now to what he said? In the EPA uh, greenhouse reporting program, are, is that voluntary and are there penalties for misreporting? It's, it's not a leading question. I don't know the answer. I, I'd have to figure, I don't know what the penalties are, but it's not voluntary. No, it's, it's mandatory. So, but it's a very limited. So we only go with a scope one emission, which are emissions out of their own stacks, right? And so yeah. one of the big challenges I think is how do you get at the downstream and upstream emissions that are the so-called scope three ones, particularly the ones where the parent company has control over their contractors and stuff. That's often a, a divisive game that it can be played. And there was a recent MBR paper that showed, uh, to your point, Michael, uh, emissions covered by that rule uh, had a, uh, let me say the rule had a profound effect on sources re reducing their emissions when they were covered by the rule, but there was also evidence of strategic gaming where they would shift emissions to their contractors, et cetera, that were not covered by the rule. So it, the design really does matter how we do that. Thank you. Um, different question from one of our attendees. What is stopping us from developing or implementing a social cost of other pollutants with particularly severe localized health impacts? So I guess what our attendee has in mind is social cost of PM 2.5. I guess we'd have to pay some attention to where this PM 2.5 hits the ground, but maybe we could do that. Any thoughts about the promised difficulties and whether it's a realistic uh, goal to have? Yeah, I think that's a softball. So the problem is, as you mentioned in the question, that these are spatially differentiated pollutants, so their damages really do matter where they're emitted. And so it's, you cannot summarize it into a single statistic. There are, uh, you know, folks in the air office have done, uh, published some papers on the benefits per ton, but rather than just say the benefits per ton of PM, they look at the benefits per ton from light duty vehicles or from the steel industry or from the power plant. So at least there's a differentiation across power plants so, or a, across an economic sector, which might allow you then to get an average benefit for that sector or an average damage if you talk about a pollutant increase. But the spatial, issues are hard to overcome in any you know, systematic way or it can't be overcome. Right, but on that, I mean, Al, here's something I've worried about. Um, you know, we talk about greenhouse gases as being global pollutants where the location of the uh, emissions doesn't matter and that's correct. But as has already been discussed in the panel, greenhouse gas emissions are often, often come correlated with emissions of local pollutants like PM 2.5 and there, it does matter. And so in some sense, we're painting an incomplete picture yeah. by looking at the greenhouse gas component of the problem and not looking at the local pollution. In some cases, the local pollution may be the greater, um, may, may be causing the greater harm. But there, I mean, there certainly has been work done. I mean, if you look at Nick Muller's work and his, his AP models um, that really are determining the, the, you know, the damage per ton emitted of PM 2.5 or SO2 or whatever from a particular location given all of the atmospheric chemistry in terms of where, where it winds up. So, I mean, there indeed, there indeed are, are uh, tools that people can look at and have, and have been used in analyzing uh, the impacts of these emissions and, and policies that affect them. Wonderful. Well, it's 3.58. It's two minutes before our closing time, and I don't think I can squeeze in another question. So I'm going to thank first the participants. You were really terrific. I was so glad when Al, Marine, and Michael all accepted um, my invitation to join this panel, and it's been a really fun and productive conversation for me. I've really enjoyed it. And I want to thank our attendees, um, our many attendees, um, for joining us and for their questions. Um, there, there's lots of good things in the chat. I will will download them and send them to the participants in case they, um, you know, have thoughts about any of these things they want to share. So a big thank you to everyone, and I especially want to thank. Um, you know, I also really want to thank my my colleagues, Derek Sylvan, 
and Anna Kazradzi, who um, took care of, of all the logistics and made this event uh, go forward so smoothly. I, I hope we'll continue all these conversations in different places. And again, thank you so very much. Thank you, Ricky. Yes, thank Bye -bye. you.